Welcome back everyone. I'm Sheila Knapp and I'm a school nurse at Drexler Middle School and Farley Elementary and I am also Health Services Coordinator for the district. Today I am with you to uh, give you some mandatory training that you're going to need regarding bloodborne pathogens and to answer any questions that you may have. So during the summer I had a friend forward this clip to me, actually several well-meaning friends forwarded this to me and I do think it kind of is the nature of the beast. We have to hear the same information every year. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot that we can do to doctor this up to make it any more interesting than what it is, but it is required that you listen to this information every year. There's an annual mandate. So the bloodborne pathogen standard applies to any and all employees who may have an occupational exposure to some sort of a potentially infectious material. To comply with OSHA standards, we are required that you hear this information um, upon initial assignment and then we do have to give you the information again every year. So whether you work for Western Dubuque or you work for some other district somewhere else, it's, it's still a requirement of your employment. So what are blood pathogens? They are basically infectious microorganisms that can cause disease in humans and the thing that you need to remember about these particular organisms are that they do have a risk for serious or life-threatening illnesses if by chance you would end up getting in contact with one of them. So there are many blood-borne organisms out there and as we all know there are many hepatitis strains out there but the three that we are most concerned about with this presentation for you to learn about every year in the school setting are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. So those are the three that we will be covering today in this presentation. So hepatitis, anytime you hear the word hepatitis, basically what that means is inflammation of the liver. And the first strain that we're going to talk about is hepatitis B. The hepatitis B illness can actually be uh, real mild in some people or it can be actually life-threatening, uh, chronic, serious, causing lifelong problems and illness. A lot of the people who have an infection with this particular organism do not have any symptoms, so it's impossible to tell who may be infected who, and who is not. The rates of hepatitis B infection have declined drastically since we started vaccinating, routinely vaccinating all children. It is now uh, given at birth uh, when a child is born and the series continues that you have to have it in order to get into school. It's now required. The hepatitis B virus is very strong and it will live off of the human host for up to seven days. So that's a, a, a statistic you kind of need to keep in the back of your mind. Um, like I said, there is a vaccination available and it is given over a six month period. The thing you should remember about hepatitis B is it can lead to very serious things if not treated properly such as cirrhosis, um, liver cancer, and even death. The symptoms for hepatitis B infection basically kind of like flu symptoms. If you end up uh, getting in contact with this strain and it causes illness in you, you may see just the similar things to a flu like fever, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, those kinds of things. The next strain we're going to talk about is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can also be either acute or chronic. The one thing you should remember about this one is that right now there is no vaccine available for hepatitis C. Again, a lot of people are infected with this particular virus and do not have any symptoms and do not know that they have it and they actually do not even feel sick. This is also a fairly strong virus. It can live off of the human host um, at least 16 hours, but it is not longer than four days. So it's not quite as strong of a virus as the hepatitis B, but it's still significant. Um, there are interventions and treatments that we have to treat hepatitis C, but a lot of them, such as the interferon treatment and some of those other drugs that they use, are, are actually very, very um, difficult for an individual to tolerate. The symptoms of hepatitis C infection, basically the same thing as hepatitis B. Uh, you're going to notice typical flu-like symptoms. Okay, the third organism that we're going to talk about is human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. As we all know, HIV attacks the immune system and can lead to the disease known as AIDS. This is not spread by uh, using the same cup or eating utensils or shaking hands or anything like that. It's obvious um, a blood-borne pathogen. HIV is not a strong virus. It's not very, um, does not tolerate being off of the human host very long. So typically it does not live on a surface for any length of time. We have really come a long way as far as treatments of HIV with antiretroviral 
drugs and that sort of thing. And I, if you remember last year, I did mention that they were able to cure somebody that had HIV via a bone marrow transplant. And I've heard a little bit more about that in the media and the news. So that is, is a very um, a step in the right direction as far as treatment. HIV symptoms, a lot of people may carry the virus for years without any symptoms. Otherwise, if you do have symptoms, it's going to be similar to the flu-like symptoms we described earlier. Again, if you end up having AIDS that is not properly treated, it can lead to a lot of very severe things and, and death. So why do we worry about this in the school setting? And as we know, your risk of transmission is low in the school setting. And typically, if somebody is exposed in the school setting, it's going to be during first aid or kind of like through accident cleanup and, and janitorial work. Um, Prevention is the best policy, so that's why we are mandated every year to provide this information to you. So basically what can happen is bloodborne pathogens are transmitted if somehow an infectious, the infectious germ gets into the body of a person who's not infected. The way that typically happens it most commonly is through open cuts or skin abrasions, uh, splatters and splashes. Another way would be the contaminated surfaces like we talked about just because a couple of these organisms are pretty strong and can survive on a surface longer than what we would, we would like to see. Accidental injury is something that we need to always be concerned about. Um, being cut with a sharp object is certainly a concern, especially if the sharp object is contaminated. So we list here the things to be aware of as needles and broken glass and that sort of thing. So reducing your risk, um, the way that we can reduce, reduce the risk of uh, some sort of an infection occurring in the school setting is that OSHA mandates that we do have a bloodborne pathogen standard in all of the buildings and in, in all schools. And the bloodborne pathogen standard includes these six particular X sections or areas, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So universal precautions is basically the concept that we consider all infectious materials um, no matter where they came from or what the source would be, that we consider them to be infectious. And you can't look at the perceived status of the source individual because bloodborne pathogens can affect all ages, any socioeconomic class, rural, inner city. Um, basically, you can't judge by looking at somebody who may be infected and who may not. Exposure control plans, um, these are also a requirement uh, from OSHA Standard 29. And basically this is a written plan that we have to have available in the district and at all buildings and it's supposed to eliminate or minimize any occupational exposures. So included in this plan is we do have, we look at all job classifications within the school setting and then we determine from that list who may have a potential or possible uh, likely exposure and those people then would be offered the hepatitis B vaccination. So if there's anybody out here uh, who thinks you may have a a risk of exposure while you're on the job and if you have not received that series, talk to your school nurse and we will um, look at your job description and see if you indeed should be vaccinated. Again, prevention is a huge thing for us that we really take very seriously so we will um, help you through that. Our exposure control plan was revised, last revised May of 2014. It's available in every building. We have, the nurses have a copy of that if you want to see it, and we will update that every year just to make sure that it's, it remains current. Another area that we need to look at is engineering and work control practices, and that's basically uh, different things that we implement in the workplace and in your daily practice to keep you safe. So these are a list of some of the things that we have included in this, such as sharp disposal containers and uh, decontamination, surface decontamination procedures, uh, biohazard bags, which are available from your school nurse, and um, injury protection procedures. So we're hoping to keep everybody healthy. Personal protective equipment, I think everybody knows what these are. The ones that you're, basically what that is, is equipment or clothing that protects you. And the ones that you're going to use most in the school setting would be gloves and gowns. Of course, barriers of any sort, whether that be a glove, uh, gauze, anything you can put between the individual and yourself to protect you. Masks, the big thing with the masks is um, make, making sure everybody wears a protective mask and you, when you do CPR on anybody. And we really stress that and, and encourage that and talk to the students about that when we do the CPR classes to all seniors. So that's something that we really take very uh, seriously as the person has to protect themselves at all times. 
post-exposure evaluation and follow-up. So this is what you would do, this is how you would treat the situation if indeed you somehow were exposed at school. Wash the area if, there's a, if there was a blood on your hands, that sort of thing. Um, if there's a cut or a needle stick, make sure that you wash that very thoroughly with soap and water. Uh, flush and irrigate any mucous membrane um, contact, whether that be eyes, ears, no, eyes, nose, mouth. Um, any type of an incident that you may feel that you may have gotten involved in, make sure that you contact the school nurse and the principal as soon as you possibly can. Uh, we will refer you for medical attention as needed, and then there is, of course, a lot of documentation that needs to be done, uh, one form being on school stream and another one that the nurses would make sure that you have filled out. Tri-State Occupational Health, as we know, we, we receive information about this every year in our uh, back-to-school letter. That is the, the district's um, occupational health provider, so that's where you would be sent for further follow-up. Hand washing sounds simple, can't stress the importance enough. The most effective way to keep yourselves healthy is, and to prevent the spread of infection is through hand washing. I, I personally don't think that we can wash our hands enough. Um, obviously, a lot of these are pretty common sense things. But another thing I always want to mention to people too is make sure that anytime you remove your gloves that you wash your hands after glove removal. So if you don't have hand washing facilities available to you, you can use an alcohol-based san hand sanitizer which should be available in your rooms. And another thing too is even after you use the hand sanitizers, I also stress that people wash their hands after that with soap and water as soon as possible. Gloves, always wear these if there's any potential contact with an infectious material. If in doubt, wear gloves. They're cheap. They call it cost a few pennies, uh, a small price to pay to keep everybody healthy and well. Obviously, these are uh, pretty common sense things. Again, don't use them if they've got holes. Don't reuse them. Don't wash them and reuse them. Um, make sure that you use change your gloves in between different contacts. Another thing is, is don't use your gloves and touch a potentially contaminated surface and then go over and open a door or pick up a phone because basically you've contaminated that surface as well. So use your gloves when you're performing the situation, when you're working in the situation that needs the gloves. Uh, remove them if you're going to touch any other surface so that you don't cross-contaminate everything in the environment. Glove removal. Just make sure that when you're taking your gloves off that you turn them inside out. We don't in want anybody to um, touch a contaminated surface of the glove. They should be discarded in a regular waste container and then, like I said earlier, always wash your hands after the gloves are removed and as soon as possible. Proper cleanup, this is something that typically all teachers at some point in time, basically all school employees at some point in time will need to do. Um, <coughs> All surfaces and equipment that come in contact with any blood must be cleaned appropriately. You can purchase a lot of registered disinfectants, but of course they're expensive. A cheaper way of cleaning up the um, surface involved here would be just a bleach and water solution. It should be deleted, diluted 1 to 10 or 1 to 100. Always wear your personal protective equipment such as your gloves when you're cleaning up any kind of a spill and uh, just use real common sense if there's any sharp objects that you're um, dealing with. And then the bottom bullet, just kind of keep this in the back of your mind as they really don't want you eating or drinking or using cosmetics or handling contacts in an area where there could be a potential for a bloodborne pathogen exposure. Disposal of waste. All used and contaminated waste can be discarded in the regular garbage unless they are so saturated with blood that when you compress them, the blood drips out. And if that's the case, they need to be disposed of in a biohazard bag. Syringes and needles and anything sharp needs to be put in a puncture-proof container. So care of the students, this is something that you always need to keep in the back of your mind, is we encourage the students to take care of their own injuries as much as possible. Uh, students can wash their own cuts and most of the time put on their own band-aids. If it should be a bloody nose or some sort of a wound that's bleeding, they can go ahead and put pressure on there with their hand using a tissue or something. A lot of times teachers, you know, want to jump in and care for everybody and so they jump in and provide care without thinking of what they need to do to protect themselves. But always take a second to think of what you need to do to put the bar a barrier between yourself and the skin. Um, there, there isn't typically going to be anything disastrous happen to the child if they get blood on their clothes or if they get blood on the floor. I would rather clean that up after the incident rather than trying to get you doctored up because you accidentally were exposed with an open cut or something along those lines. 
Okay, so in conclusion, I just want you to remember that typically most school staff are not at high risk of exposure, um, and most of the time exposures do not result in infection. Um, consi re always remember your hand washing is the best prevention. Um, again, it's, it's just one of those things that we need to remind you of every year using best practices, but you are not at high risk in the school setting. The Bloodborne Pathogen Standard Fact Sheet is something that we are supposed to provide copies of to all staff members. So I just put the website on here in case anybody ever wants to go ahead and download that or look at it. So I'm just providing you with that information as required under the OSHA standard. And again, we are required that we allow you to ask questions as needed. At one point in time, we did have an interactive discussion board available. So at this point in time, I'm just going to tell you that if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to talk to one of your school nurses, and we will help you through whatever the situation may be. So just a quick quiz for you to, um, that I will help you with. Um, HIV is the only infectious disease carried by the blood that you should be in concern with. And that is false. There are three organisms that we talk about in the school setting, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. The next one, only inner city children are infected with HIV viruses, and that is false. Um, anybody, anywhere can be infected with any one of these particular organisms. Hepatitis B can severely damage your liver, leading to cirrhosis and death, and that is true. Hepatitis B can survive on environmental surfaces dried and at room temperature for at least a week. And this is true, that's why this is our surface decontamination procedures are so important. Universal precautions requires that you consider every person, all blood and body fluids to be potentially infectious, and that is true. You only need to wash your hands at the end of each workday, and that is false. If in doubt, wash your hands. Uh, wash your hands as much as you possibly can. You must use appropriate personal protective equipment each time you perform a task involving potentially infectious material and this is true. Always wear gloves and use a broom and dustpan to pick up glass and sharp ob objects, and that is true. A bleach to water solution may not be used to disinfect equipment and working surfaces, and that is false. Bleach and water solution is totally fine to use, plus it's inexpensive. Your school system will create and make available an exposure control plan, and that is true. So on behalf of the nurses within the district, we want to welcome everybody back and wish you have a safe and healthy school year. If you have any questions in any of this material or if you need supplies, do not hesitate to contact one of your nurses. And as always, you can feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions.